Okay. Um, I'm going to open the final budget hearing um, for uh, September 28th at 6 p.m. We're closed. Um, and I'm going to dispense with the pledge and the invitation so we can get right to business. So, release. Okay, Commissioner McMullen. Present. Commissioner Pollan. Here. Commissioner Ramos. Present. Vice Mayor Satterfield. Present. Mayor Stark. We're here to have a quorum. Okay. Resolution 2021 08. Somebody's reading. We need the drum roll. All right, so tonight we have the final budget public hearing that we need to go through for our statutory requirements and our trim. Uh, so the, the purpose of the public hearing is to present to the public the final millage rate, the rollback millage rate, and the final budget for FY2023. Do we need to read the resolution? I'm going to. Okay. I'm going to give you a little background and then we'll get to, I'll read the resolution and I've got a couple other statements I have to read and then we'll uh, okay. I'll cover you to vote. I should have known. All right. So, uh, presentation outline will be the presentation of the millage rate. Um, it, at that point, it'll we'll open up the public comment. Uh, we'll, we'll read the, the resolution. Um, so you're going to be weighing it, or you're going to be approving the final millage rate and the final budget for next year. So just a little history, and I'm going to go through this presentation pretty quickly because this is this will be the third time that we've gone through this. Um, just a little history on the millage rate for the town. So, so going back for the previous seven years, it was 6.75. Uh, so for four years, they dropped down to 6.65. Uh, then down to 6.5, stayed at 6.5 for one year or for two years, essentially two budget years. Uh, and that was during COVID when we weren't sure where revenues were going to go. Uh, so the recommendation was to keep it at the same. Uh, property values and revenues have been strong going into the ending this year and going into next year. So the recommendation is to reduce the millage to 6.4. So that's three out of the last four years that the, the, the millage rate will have gone down for the town. So the next slide is just to, to go over the particulars um, with the requirements. So this is for the town of Oakland. This is the millage rate. This is the only millage rate that, that the town commission assesses. The FY 2021 millage was 6.5. The millage that was approved for the trim services that went out in August was 6.5. Uh, the millage rate that was approved at the first call. 6.4 and the, what's being presented tonight, 6.4. Um, that is, and then the rollback rate is 6.0818. So the um, the recommended rate is uh, as a percent of the rollback rate is 5.23% increase over the rollback rate. So I can read through the resolution real quick and then we can open up the, the public comment. Okay. Uh, basically, I'm going to read the title first is, uh, this is resolution 2021-08, the resolution of the town of Oakland, Florida, levying the at warm property tax millage rate for municipal purposes on all taxable property within the town for the fiscal year beginning October 1, 2021, and ending September 30th, 2022, providing for conflicts, providing for severability, and providing for an uh, effective date, actually, beginning, yeah, we got it right. Uh, and providing for an effective date. And I'm going to read a couple of statements out of the resolution. Uh, section two, the ad valorem property tax millage rate for the municipal purposes to be levied on the taxable property within the town limits in the town of Oakland, Florida, during the fiscal year beginning October 1, 2021, and ending September 30th, 2022, is hereby set at the rate of 6.4 mills. Uh, and so the percentage by which this millage rate to be levied exceeds the rollback rate of 6.0818 is 5.23%, and that was computed for CERN to Florida law. So with that, I will turn it back over to you, Mayor, for public comment, and then um, the, the next slide will be the uh, approval of the resolution. 
Um, do we have any thoughts or comments at the table? No. Okay. Um, in the public audience, do we have anyone who wishes to speak on this matter? Okay. From afar. Do we have anybody that's raised their hand, Alicia? I do not see any hands raised. Okay. Bring it back to the table. I need a motion, please. Here's the uh, request of action. Uh, adopt the Town of Oakland Final Knowledge Rate Resolution 2021-08 of 6.40 dollars. I'll make a motion to adopt the Town of Oakland Final Millage Rate Resolution 2021-08 of 6.40 mil. I'll take it. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Any questions, any comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, uh, I'm going to go through the uh, just a quick recap of the budget, um, and then um, I'll have a, another motion and a, another resolution uh, at the end of the budget to approve the budget. So, budget principles again: we always we're, we're looking at the, uh, the millage rate from year to year, looking for opportunities to reduce it. We're looking to make sure we're setting aside adequate reserves, and then we've done a lot of planning for infrastructure projects, uh, both at the school and with the town. Uh, with water, wastewater, and uh, sewer connections. So moving into the budget, I'm going to start with the general fund. Again, the general fund is uh, $10 million, $10,039,803. Property values did increase by 17%. The budget was based on the military that was just approved of 6.4. Um, again, um, we did reduce it at the first public hearing. The estimated reserves for next year is seven hundred and twenty-five thousand uh, dollars. The general fund and the reserves um, are still not quite where we need to be on reserves. If you listen to our auditor, we need to be somewhere between fifteen and twenty-five percent on reserves. So that is something we we'll continue to work on um, as as staff as for future budgets. <laughs> Uh, some of the, the particulars with the general fund, again, is the Orange County Fire Rescue that's per contract, and that changes as the property value change. Again, town residents are paying essentially the same as what an unincorporated resident would be paying uh, with a, a very similar military. But again, just as uh, unincorporated residents, as those values go up, the, the, uh, the cost goes up, and same here. So we've added more properties, so that's why that contract's increased. Um, it does include uh, funding for salary increases appraisal for the town staff, uh, director of the center for the Oakland Police Department. Again, we're in a very tight labor market and we want to make sure we retain the, the, the great staff uh, that we do have. Uh, it does include an in increase in the contribution and you'll see that on the regular agenda at seven o'clock. I've got a resolution that increases the contribution from 10% to 12% for our sworn officers. Uh, it includes funding for a part-time event, event coordinator. Uh, we have increased the budget for events, especially the, the Light of Oakland event. Um, I think we're going to do some very special things this year. And then the one thing that changed from July to the first public hearing was we included the HVAC project, both the, the lease proceeds, the revenue side, and the, the actual construction project. That is under design. We should be hearing back from uh, the uh, engineers soon on the, the next step. Facility fund, uh, $6.8 million, $6,818,600. Again, we've got increasing revenues because we're adding customers. Uh, it does include funding. We've got staff that, that work under the utility fund, so it does increase the same 4% salary increase based on performance appraisals. We did add a utility building supervisor position, uh, and our reserves are very healthy in the utility fund at $1.5 million. If you look at a year-to-year -year comparison on the utility fund, it has increased uh, significantly, and that's going to be because of infrastructure projects. And you'll see that... Um, on the regular agenda, we have a resolution to accept the funding uh, for the ARPA money, which we get, get it in two tranches. Uh, water and wastewater is one of the four items that you can use that money for. Again, it's an allocation based off of the town size. Uh, it comes from the feds through the state to us. 
So the three projects under that um, is the uh, lift station number six, um, the connection of the school and the public safety building to lift station number six, and then the additional water well that we've been talking about. We do have three major grant projects going on, the Hall Avenue Septic and Sewer Project, uh, the lift station number six project, and the, the most recent is lift station number seven down Jefferson Street. Uh, I'm not going to go through each individual impact fee project. We have about $5 million in impact fees that have been allocated in the different areas that they've been collected. We've got the water system where we've got the additional well project that we've been talking about, which is moving along fairly quickly. Uh, we've got the alternative water project that we've been talking about. We've got the seed money for that. And we are looking to get some grant money for that project in the future. Uh, we've got some wastewater system projects, uh, including the CDBG project, which is our share of the funding of that project. Uh, Parks and Recreation, uh, we've got funding in there and we, we're gonna have to come back and talk a little bit about the funding. I don't have uh, any um, quotes yet on the shade sales, but we do have money in there to continue with the Spear Park, including uh, that could include shade sales, uh, the additional pavilion that was shown in the plans, the butterfly garden and the additional junior basketball court that's, that was contemplated. We are working on the Sadler Trail Park um, phase one. Right now we're working on getting the, the trail down and Mike's been working on that. That's probably gonna roll in the next, it will roll in the next year. But additionally, we're looking at some enhancements along that trail uh, that could include a playground, exercise stations and a potential dog park in that area once we can um, get that developed. So it's probably on a two year window, but we're, we're putting that funding together to get that project going. Law enforcement, again, we're looking at the renovation of the building to, to provide some additional capacity and some additional workspaces and a camera project that um, for traffic cameras that uh, Chief Peak has been working on. Transportation, the big project there is the Oakland Avenue roundabout, which I'm waiting to hear when that will go to the Orange County Commission for approval of the contractor. But that again, that is scheduled to happen in January. People are feeling a lot of pain right now with the bridge closing. We've got this additional project that will start happening in January or February timeframe uh, with the roundabout. They do have a lot of space on that project to do work that won't impact traffic, but there will be points in time where the traffic will be impacted. Um, and we're, again, we're doing some more turnouts and we've got reserves for future projects. And the other one we're trying to get done um, and we'll have more information on the next agenda for that is the Star Street connection, uh, north-south connection from Oakland Avenue to Highway 50, giving us another outlet to Highway 50 uh, from Oakland Avenue. Um, so that's hopefully something we can be working on in the spring uh, to give that additional access out to Highway 50. And then the last thing is just, you know, we, we, we do know we're going to need some future space. Um, it's kind of low down on the priority list right now, but we will need to look at that. So we've got some money in there for future space. And uh, the fire protection, uh, we've allocated some funds to, to do some additional hydrants. We just did one down on Oakland Avenue. I think we posted on Facebook, but we are making sure we're filling in any gaps that we need hydrants uh, for fire protection. So, sorry, I'm to remember to click up. So the last uh, part of this is the Oakland Avenue Charter School. Uh, the budget for the Oakland Avenue Charter School is $5,837,897. Again, the charter school is funded through the state. We are a school that provides uh, education to not just Oakland residents, but anybody uh, that, that, that meets the priorities as far as we've got Lake County and, and Orange County residents. So the funding is state funding for the charter school. It is not funded through property taxes of the town. Um, the June budget approval uh, was just to get something on, on record. We did not have the funding calculator at that time. The budget was updated for the first public hearing. Um, it includes the PPK program. It includes the effort grant funding that we're getting through the, uh, the, the CARES Act and the, uh, the federal money that has been put for for COVID. Uh, we do have some COVID-19 expenses included in here, including staffing, nurse, and additional janitorial and PPD supplies. And the reserves are estimated at 200, just under $275,000. So saying all that, we've got four major budgets that total $27 million, 27 
million seven hundred and sixty two thousand five hundred and thirty four dollars. We have a balanced budget uh, for the town. It is an increase from previous year, but again, we've got uh, an enormous amount of infrastructure projects that we're working on between impact fees, grants, and then the, the AC units. Uh, we've got a significant number of uh, projects that weren't in the previous year. But so, with that, the, um, I'll read the, uh, the the title of the resolution, and um, and then the, the, you see the request of action. So, resolution 2021-09, a resolution of the Town Commission of Oakland, Florida, adopting the budget for fiscal year 2021 slash 2022, providing for severability and providing for an effective date. Again, um, the, the requested actions adopt uh, budget resolution 2021-09 for the FY 2022 final budget totaling $27,762,534. I'll let off. <laughs> Parker with the infrastructure projects. Um, they've done a great job this year together. Uh, we've got our work cut out for us next year um, with all the different things we got going on. So. I agree. So with that, I'll, I'll <laughs> uh, Hey, do you have a, um, a suggested action? Yeah, just adopt the final budget for okay, 2109 gotcha. All right. for the FY2022 budget. Um, anybody at the table have any questions or comments? Just a comment. Oh, go ahead. So. Sorry, no, you, all you right. Hey, hey, Sorry. Just to thank you to all you guys. Um, and, and we say this every year and every year, it seems these days, you do more and more and more. And it's just, the, to me personally, it's phenomenal how you get it all done. So it is just very, very much appreciated. I speak for me, I'm sure I speak for all of us and everyone else will too, but, but thank you all so much. And we're very, very um, happy to follow through on our commitment to continue to lower the ad valorems. Sal? Kato, I, I can't find enough words of affirmation for all you guys. You guys. Great job. Thank you. Okay. Um, do I have any public comment here in the room? All right. Do I have any public comment from afar? Do we have any hands raised? We do. Flavio yes. can tell us. Flavio? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi. Uh... I just wanted to ask one question about, um, is there any plan or any, is, is, is it being taken into consideration the, the crossing of Avalon and Oakland Avenue when you know, there's always a lot of traffic in the morning because there's not a, a lane for turning left when you come from Winter Garden to Oakland. So that kind of gets a, kind of a traffic there. Is there any, have you guys any uh, considered that for any kind of work to improve that crossing? Steve, is that something we want to talk about during budget or something well, for us? If he's talking about Avalon coming from Winter Garden, that's in Winter Garden. Winter Garden. That's that's not an Oakland Avenue. That's not an Oakland town of Oakland intersection. So we have not considered it. Okay. That's All right. What, Thank you. Yeah, that, that would be a, a city of Winter Garden and uh, Orange County. I believe Orange County has jurisdiction of Avalon. And Winter Garden has jurisdiction of, of Oakland Avenue at that section. So you're talking at Tilden Road where Tildenville Elementary is? The light right there, right? That light. Flavio? He's, he's um, muted. He's on mute. Oh, unmuting, please. Oh, I just, <laughs> sorry, Alicia, go ahead. Flavio, are you unmuted? No, yeah, I'm, I'm just, can okay. you hear me? Are you talking about the light at Tiltonville Road where the Tiltonville yeah. Elementary is? Yes, that's Winter Garden okay. and possibly Orange County. All right, thank you. Sure. Anything else? All right. Any other hands? 
No, no other hands are raised. Okay, thank okay. you. All right, I'll bring it back to the table. Did I get a motion? No. I'll make okay, I'll take a motion. I'll make a motion to adopt the final budget resolution 2021-09 for the FY 2022 final budget totaling $27,762,534. I'll second it. <laughs> yeah, I, Mike and I remember when it was like 10. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it was lower than that in the very beginning. I think it was yeah, lower, no. yes. And there was a pile of money missing. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah that's not counting. Not that's not <laughs> counting the money that was missing. Um, so anyway, uh, if we have no further comments, uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Thank you very much. This, this short presentation boils down from an immense amount of work and thank you very much. So um, we're gonna adjourn for five minutes and then we will start the regular meeting. I'd like to call this town commission meeting to order for September 28th for the pledge and the invocation. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So. Father God, thank you once again for entrusting us with your town. I ask that you give us your wisdom and discernment and that we make decisions that are best for our town citizens and everything we say is edifying and uh and honoring to you we say this in your beautiful name jesus christ amen thanks sir Commissioner Ramos. Here. Commissioner Ramos. Present. Vice Mayor Satterfield. Present. Mayor Stark. Here. Have a crown. All right. Um, I think you took my <laughs> presentation. <laughs> There's nobody here to receive so okay. Okay, thank you. <laughs> For those of you who are joining us um, at seven, just to catch you up, we did uh, do our final uh, acceptance of the budget and we did um, lower our millage rate as our commitments. Um, so uh, we're very happy about that. And we will uh, start with two proclamations. Um, the first one is Town of Oakland Blind Americans Equality Day, whereas by joint resolution approved on October 6, 1964, Public Law 88-628 as amended, Congress designated October 15th each year as White Cane Safety Day to recognize the contributions of Americans who are blind or have impaired vision. Whereas it is important that all residents of the town of Oakland that are blind or visually impaired have the opportunity to live active, independent lives. And whereas approximately 32,000 residents in Central Florida are blind or visually impaired, and whereas for Floridians who are blind or visually impaired, the white cane is an important tool for self-reliance and full participation and inclusion in our society. And whereas the use of white canes, dog guides, and public and private transportation programs have ensured Floridians who are blind or visually impaired can travel efficiently and safely, breaking down barriers to success and independence. 
Whereas in 2011, White Cane Safety Day was named Blind Americans Equality Day by President Barack Obama. And where this proclamation called upon public officials, businesses, community leaders, educators, librarians, and Americans across the country to observe this day with appropriate ceremonies, activities, and programs to celebrate and recognize the accomplishments and contributions of blind and visually impaired Americans. Whereas we recommit to forging ahead with work of perfecting our union and ensuring our ensuring we remain a nation where all our people, including those living with disabilities, have every opportunity to achieve their dreams. Very nice. Very nice. Very nicely done. Um, second one's Town of Oakland National Breast Cancer Awareness Month, whereas October 2021, can't get used to that, marks 36 years that National Breast Cancer Awareness Month has educated women and men about early breast cancer detection, diagnosis, and treatment. And whereas one in eight women will be diagnosed with breast cancer in their lifetime, and whereas through early detection, improved treatments, and five-year survival rate is 90%. And whereas this month we honor those lost to breast cancer, let us join with the loved ones who celebrate their memory and the patients who battle this disease every day, as well as our nation's advocates, medical researchers, and healthcare providers to renew our commitment to better prevent, detect, and treat breast cancer. And whereas the American Cancer Society has searched endlessly for a cure through vital research and has had the mammoth task of educating our community Americans of the risks. <coughs> Now, therefore, I, Kathy Stark, by virtue of the authority vested in me as the mayor of the town of Oakland and on behalf of the entire town commission, do hereby proclaim the month of October 2021 as Breast Cancer Awareness Month. There's one more. <laughs> <laughs> no, my voice is not what it should be. Um, okay, so we come to public forum where oh, we're still in presentations. Can I just take oh, a yes. and, and introduce Noreen? Yes, please. So real quick, I'm going to read her bio and uh, just introduce Noreen to everybody. Uh, so uh, Noreen is our new HR director. Uh, Noreen is a certified human resource professional who launched her human resources career in benefits, retirement planning, and compensation. She has 20 plus years of human resources experience, mostly in education and healthcare. Noreen is a results driven human resources professional with varied experience in human resources and education, a, su a successful track record of developing processes that improve organizational effectiveness, a strong communicator with effective interpersonal skills, and an expertise in building relationships to develop the link between HR partners and stakeholders. Uh, she's got a, uh, she's a graduate of West Webster University, where she has a Master of Arts degree in Human Resource Management and Organizational Development, and a Bachelor of Science degree from Jacksonville University in Marketing and Communication. She comes to us with a wealth of knowledge and experience, and she's already hit the ground running. So I uh, just want to make sure everybody has, has an opportunity to, to meet Noreen this, this evening, and um, we're, we're very happy to have her. So, welcome. Stand up so we can see you. I can't see you for the podium. Welcome. welcome. So very happy to have you on here. Thank you for that moment. We are very happy. They all say welcome. I say good luck. <laughs> She's results driven, so take the hill. Yeah, her results may be your downfall. <laughs> <laughs> then we'll all be happy. Oh, <laughs> Welcome, Noreen, and we're happy to see you. Thank you very much. All right, now I can go to public. Comment. 
Um, we have public forum where um, we recognize anybody who would like to speak on something that is not already on the agenda for tonight. Yeah. Your comments brief, less than three minutes, and um, that you let us know who you are and sign the document. Do we have anybody? Not that's signed up yet or expressed. Do you have any hands raised? Mayor, I see no hands raised. Moving on to consent agenda. Oh, wait, there was a hand raised there. No, yeah, one of you. Oh, it's just oh, me again. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, do we have anybody or not? Yes, audience. Right audience. Sorry, not on um, there. Hi. You have to speak louder than that. Not a very loud person. Um, my reason, my name is Cherie. Um, my reason for coming up in front of you guys this evening is just to touch back on our emergency meeting that we had last month in which many, and I mean many people found and thought that everyone had their decision predetermined, mm -hmm. that voices weren't heard because the majority of people were against the mask mandate. Um, so I'm going to try to break through this as quickly as possible, just because some things have changed since then. It's been going back and forth. But as of today, um, just a second. It's an agenda. Thanks. It is on the agenda. It is on the agenda. Yeah. Um, it's under other policy matters. Okay. And it's um, Department of Health Rule 64 DER. So we are going to talk about it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Anybody else? Okay, consent agenda. Um, do we have anything that we have questions about, want to pull out, or I need a motion? I'll make a motion to accept the consent agenda as presented. I'll second it. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Do we have any questions or comments? All in favor? Uh, Hi. Okay, resolution 2021-10. I'll read it um, for the record. Resolution of the Town Commission of the Town of accepting and acknowledging allocation of $1,564,166 from the U.S. Department of Treasury as part of the coronavirus state and local Fiscal recovery funds through the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021 on behalf of the town of Oakland, providing for an effective date. All right, I do not have a presentation for this, but this is uh, part of the process that we need to go through to accept the American Rescue Plan uh, funds. So, uh, we, the, the town of Oakland, is eligible to receive funding from the coronavirus state and local fiscal recovery funds of HR 1319. American Rescue Plan Act of 2021. That's my The total available funding to the town is $1,564,166 that will be available in two tranches, 12 months apart. We have received the first tranche of 782,000. And if you notice in the budget, we have appropriated that money that the commission has uh, appropriated that money for three projects. The project for next year is still to be determined, but we are, we'll talk about it a little bit on the 12th, but the alternative water project <laughs> is probably a, a very good place for that second tranche of funds next year. But what I, what we need to do is um, have the commission approve this resolution to accept those funds. Okay. Do we have any questions or comments at the table? All right, I need a motion, please. I'll make a motion to approve resolution 2021 10 to accept the ARPA funds. I'll second it. It's removed and seconded. Um, do I have any public comment in the building? Is there any stipulation for receiving those funds? Were you, for example, like universal masking? No, sir. Do you have any of the funds slated to be received by any public, private? Anybody? Uh, based on universal masking, no, sir. 
I don't think I understood your question. I do. <laughs> Please you have him come up. The yes, can you come up? Yeah. The ARP funds, there's a lawsuit in Ohio right now. And the guidelines, uh, which are the operational strategy for K 12 schools through the phase prevention. I know there's been numerous updates to it, but there was a letter sent out by the Secretary of Education. You know, talking about how you had to adhere to this, you know, operational strategy, and the guidelines suggest that a school board would forfeit ARP allocations by making masks optional, and states that have prohibited mask mandates in schools have received letter notifying them that they will not receive ARP funds. Accordingly, it seems defendants of this lawsuit in particular have a financial incentive for for implementing the mass mandate, despite that such a requirement serves no scientific purpose and subjects individuals who wear masks to the health risks discussed previously in the lawsuit. So my question again was, has this body or this town in conjunction with OCPS, because we're in a unique situation here with this school as being one of two schools in the state of Florida that isn't bound by a school board, have you received any public, private? Um, let me see what I have it here. Are you in possession of or slated to receive any state, federal, or private funding and or grants from any entity on the condition of universal masking, vaccinating, otherwise known as experimental gene therapy, or any other COVID-related protocols for staff or students? in the Orange County school system and specifically OACS, yes or no? No, sir. No. 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 This funding that we're talking about is for- Yeah, but my, my comments explained it further. Than I that. understand that, but we're talking about this. Uh, okay. I, and I, this I, is what's on the table to be approved. So, and there are no strings, so, there are nothing so, but universal, universal math. So that this letter wasn't sent out by the Secretary of Education, and this isn't what you guys have to work off of provided by the CDC to receive those monies. That's your answer, right? Correct. I yeah. just want to make sure I understand. I did not receive that letter. No. Okay. You guys never received this? Because these are the guidelines that we're all working off of in the schools. Those funds are not these funds. These are ARP funds. Right. But these are, there's different tranches within that legislation. Okay. These were for local governments, including the state, the county, and all the cities in Florida. This has nothing to do with school boards. Okay. So, but this thanks, town thanks. runs the school board. Right. So that would encompass that? No, they're separate. It's two separate. Two separate. Yes. Just get into the SR1, SR2, SR3, and all of that. It's hard to understand. I get it. I've been trying to myself. School so has its own budget. budget. Town has its own budget. We we own and we 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 run the school, but we don't combine the money. So the money that comes through this to go to the town won't have anything to do with the school or vice versa. Okay. So, so the only thing that we're discussing right this minute though is this funding coming to the town with very specific four very specific um, areas. To be spent, water and wastewater is part of that, and that's where well, that, that's kind of got me to this point. Really, is uh, you know the HVAC is two point nine million dollars, and yeah, I have a friend who's an HVAC engineer. He says that should be over a million, but I don't know. Well, oh, you know what? I don't. That's know. not. You know, let me finish. Uh, no. Interrupt you. No. Interrupt you. No. So the utility fund recognizes hey. the American hey, Rescue Plan hey, proceeds. Hey, hey. You know whose meeting this is? Man. It's mine. Yeah. What? It's my meeting. I run it. Who do you work We for? are not talking about the HVAC system, so you may sit down now. We're talking about the water. If you would have let me finish, I would have just said that. Enough. 782000 allocated for wastewater was my question. That was not your question. Your question was <laughs> spending too much money on the HVAC system. Yes, it was. That's what you heard, and that's what Please, you're way over your three minutes. Please sit down. Ma'am, can I just finish reading Please. the question I have before you cut me off? Please sit down. For public comment, have you made your comment? 
I was trying to finish my comment before I was cut off by the mayor. The mayor is the chair and she has the authority to run this meeting. Okay, so I can't finish the question. That She's asked you to sit down and you've reached your time limit. You should sit down. Okay, so why was the money moved to the water from the utility? <laughs> Not understand, please sit down. I, I just had that one question, that was it. Sir, please, please sit down. I get it. You're not allowed to continue and create disturbance. That's her right to do. Now, this is an official proceeding according to Florida State Stats. That she runs it. Runs it. You do not get to grumble from the audience. And I'm sorry, but you can't sit there in silent opposition. You will be asked to leave. I had a question, a genuine question. No, All right. We're done. Right now. We're done. Do we have any other questions about this subject? Okay. Do, I need a motion. You already had the motion. I have my motion and second. All right. Any further comments or questions at the table? All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Resolution 2021-11, police officer retirement change. Resolution 2021-12, a resolution of the Commission of the Town of Oakland, Florida, amending the defined contribution retirement plan for the police officers of Oakland, Florida, providing for conflicting resolution and providing an effective date. So this, uh, this resolution 2021-11 is to make official what's been budgeted um, per the uh, sworn officers of increasing the uh, Contributions from 10% to 12% for the retirement. And this is what we talked about at the budget here. Yes. Yes. So it has been budgeted and funded. So this makes it makes it official. And we can let the Florida League of Cities know what we're doing. Okay. So do we have any questions or comments at the table? Nope. All right. I need a motion, please. I'll make a motion to accept resolution 2021-11. Police officer retirement change. I'll second it. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Do we have any questions or comments in the building? All right, do we have anybody from afar who has a question or comment? Please raise your hand. Mayor, I see no hands raised. Thank you. I'll bring it back to the table. If we have no further discussion, all in favor? Aye. All right. Aye. Resolution 2021-12, preserve and restore the West Orange Trail. Resolution of the Town Commission of the Town of Oakland, Florida to actively support the objectives of the Stakeholder Task Force and actively participate to preserve and restore the original canopy and rural character of the West Orange Trail. All right, this is just to, and, and these are things that the, the town's already doing is to preserve the canopy and the character of the West Orange Trail. <laughs> Um, we've got a, uh, Joe Dunn with Friends of Lake Apopka has put together a small stakeholder group. Actually, it's, it's gotten larger, but the, the idea is to make sure that all the jurisdictions along the West Orange Trail um, continue to um, you know, take care of the trail and take care of its character. Um, there is a lot of encroachment for development. Um, so all the different jurisdictions are being asked to, to, to pass a resolution showing their commitment. The town's always been committed to the West Orange Trail um, and keeping that character. And so that's that's essentially what this 2021-12 uh, does. So. Do we have any questions or comments at the table? And that's the whole trail. That's not just there. Yeah, it's the whole trail from, from the Lake County line all the way to Apopka. So um, there's been discussions with uh, Oakland, Winter Garden, Ocoee, Apopka, okay. the West Orange Chamber, West Orange Healthcare District, everybody that, that's got a stake in the trail. So we're all you know, talking together, which I think is good as far as you know, maintaining that character. And we got a question too. Is this going to tie in to the coast to coast piece that the, the state is trying to do as well? Yes, yeah, so, and, that, and that's that's part of what I think got got Joe thinking about it, and, and the rest of us thinking about it is the coast to coast trail is being 
the gaps are being finished on the coast to coast trail. And so, you know, we're going to be on that coast to coast trail. We got a great opportunity for ecotourism and, and to really show, you know, the people that, that travel here for, for trails to, to show them what it's really like. We've got a great, a great asset here in town. So, along with the Oakland Nature Preserve, the Friends of Lake Apopka, I mean, all the cities have to combine, whether Orange County or Lake County. Joe Dunn is doing a great job. Yeah. He sure is. We got a lot of advocates for trails, and, and he's right at the top. So, I would agree. All right. Any further questions at the table? All right. I need a motion, please. I'll make a motion. What? I'll make a motion to approve resolution 2021 12. Second. Okay. Moved and seconded. Do we have any questions or comments in the building? Do you have any questions or comments from afar? Please raise your hand. Mayor, I see no hands raised. Thank you. Bring it back to the table. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. We are now going to discuss the discussion of the Department of Health Rule 64 DER 21 Before we get started, <laughs> Steve is going to fill us in. And for you, those of you who um, may wonder, may think, may have an opinion of what we come into this room thinking, we make sure that we are uh, filled in on what we will be talking about tonight as far as facts go. And that is all that we have, but we are prepared to have these discussions and we have information that has been given to us in a, in a way that we may have these discussions in an efficient manner. We will take public comment. We will ask you to keep your comments to three minutes. And um, we will talk about this subject, which I know it is a polarizing subject. Okay, Steve. With respect. Polite discussions. <laughs> yeah, with respect. Yes, and we, and we will be courteous. All right, so this is the, uh, the discussion. Yeah. The health emergency rule that was signed on on Wednesday of last week. So, just want to give a little background. Um, so, on July 27th, you know, uh, before the school year started, the town commission did approve a mass policy following the recommendations of the Florida Department of of Health and the Florida Department of Education, making masks voluntary. Uh, at that time, we had about 55% uh, of the students whose parents had opted out of wearing masks and 45% that opted to wear masks. On August 30th, 2021, the commission had a discussion and the town commission uh, made the decision to mandate masks following Orange County Public Schools effective September 7th, 2021 to November 9th of 2021. So the reason that we are here tonight is on September 22nd, 2021, the state surgeon general issued a notice of emergency rule 64 DER 21 15 protocols for controlling COVID 19 in school settings. The emergency rule was effective immediately. The emergency rule covers both quarantine protocols and facial coverings. Uh, because of the way that the rule was written, uh, talked with the mayor and about bringing this forward for the discussion because it encompassed both the quarantine protocols that the commission needs to be aware of, as well as the, um, including the mask, uh, some, some language about masks, <coughs> facial coverings. I'm gonna go through just some excerpts of the uh, Department of Health. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna to try to go through every, every line by line, but I just wanted to give, go through some of the excerpts from the Department of Health emergency ruling. So the first one, this is under section one, it's, it's section D, um, under the general protocols, uh, masks, uh, facial coverings, 
So under section D, schools may adopt requirements for students to wear masks or facial coverings as a mitigation measure. However, the school must allow for a parent or legal guardian of the student to opt the student out of wearing a face covering or mask at the parent or legal guardian's sole discretion. So they have tightened up the language a little bit from the, their previous um, uh, uh, orders that were out there. The next two sections have to do with um, the quarantine protocols. So the first one is for symptomatic or COVID-19 positive. Uh, so the protocols for symptomatic or COVID-19 positive students, schools will ensure students experiencing any symptoms consistent with COVID-19 or who have received a positive diagnostic test for COVID-19 shall not attend school, school-sponsored activities or be on school property until A, the student receives a negative diagnostic COVID-19 test and is asymptomatic, B, 10 days have passed since the onset of symptoms or positive test result. The, the student has had no fever for 24 hours and the student's other symptoms are improving. Or C, the student receives written permission to return to school from a medical doctor licensed under chapter 458 and, op, and so licensed under chapter 458. Um, and then the other part of this that's, that's changed a little more significantly from previous orders is the exposure protocols. Um, we've had, I believe, nearly 400 um, uh, isolations or quarantines since the beginning of the year with uh, um, the charter school following the previous protocols. These new protocols are going to change that. So under section three, protocols for students with exposure to COVID-19, schools shall allow parents or legal guardians the authority to choose how their child receives education after having direct contact with an individual that is positive for COVID-19. A, parents or legal guardians of students who are known to have been in direct contact with an individual who received a positive diagnostic test for COVID-19 may choose one of the following options. Number one, allow the student to attend school, school-sponsored activities, or be on school property without restrictions or disparate treatment so long as the student remains asymptomatic. Or two, the other option would be quarantine the student for a period of time up to at least seven days the date of last direct contact with an individual that is positive for COVID-19. They do have uh, in the agenda, they do have some, uh, some de a decision matrix on, on how this works. Uh, I'm gonna go through just, just an update of the numbers that, that were discussed um, on August 30th. So, um, and it's really hard to discern with OCTS whether there's been any improvement. I'm not gonna make any judgments on their numbers. I'm just giving you what they had on their, their dashboard. Uh, on August 30th, they had 3,289 confirmed cases, 631 employees, 2,643 students and 15 vendors. At the time, they had 1,427 active quarantines. Uh, as of yesterday, when I pulled up their CPS dashboard, the, the total number of confirmed cases is 6,641 confirmed cases. 1,071 employees, 5,539 students, 31 vendors, um, 800, currently they have 890 active quarantines, um, one employee and 889 students. So I, uh, on the next slide, and this is where I am, um, and real quick, uh, an update on OCPS. So as I understand it, they are continuing with their mask mandate until October 30th, but they are moving forward with the new quarantine protocols as they've been um, presented. Um, the next would be OECS, uh, where we were on August 30th. So, and August 30th is about the third week of school. So, uh, in three weeks, they had 29 confirmed cases, one teacher, one after school staff, and 27 students. And there were 27 active quarantines at that point in time. Over the course of the entire, I'll say it's about seven weeks of school, and they've had about 400 quarantines. But in the most recent week, ending September 24, they had a total of 42 confirmed cases, which is only an increase of 13 uh, from, the, uh, from the 30th. So in four weeks, we only increased 13 cases. And two of those cases were confirmed to be uh, false positives. Um, 
That's two teachers, one after school staff and 39 students. And as of Friday, I'm not sure where we're at today, but as of Friday, we had one active quarantine. Um, zero, 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 zero. What's that? Zero, zero cases. So, um, and part of this, I, I want to give a lot of credit to the school staff. We have staff, we've got a nurse on premises, and we've got staff that are vigilant and uh, follow through and quickly react when they need to react, um, especially with the, the cases that are that are positive. So um, I want to make sure that I, I give them the due credit because we do have incredible staff over this year. The one other uh, big change from August 30th is the Orange County Department of Health. You know, they've been doing their 14 day rolling positivity rate. Uh, it was up around just under 20% at one point, but on August 30th, it was at 17.86%. Um, today, or actually yesterday was uh, Mayor Deming's um, latest press conference. It was uh, at 9.31%. So, you know, what I, what I can take out of what, what I'm seeing is we've got staff that's done an incredible job at the school. Our numbers are down. They've been very manageable, especially in the last week. Um, and then the, it looks like uh, we've hit the peak of the Delta variant and things are coming down. Um, so, you know, we're in a very good position tonight to have this discussion with this new Department of Health order. Um, I can tell you that I, I know there's, you know, conflicting information. The CDC does recommend for, you know, universally for indoor masking at schools. Uh, I've just looked up the latest CDC information, um, but we uh, we do have the state of Florida and the Surgeon General with a uh, an order, an emergency order, with some very clear direction on uh, both mask and uh, quarantine. <laughs> So, and you know the uh, on the legal side of it, there was a, there's still a lot of a lot of back and forth. Honestly, there were some some um, challenges, some administrative challenges that you know between the, the counties or the school boards. There were five school boards that were challenging the uh, the original Department of Health emergency order. Uh, the way this one replaced the old order, those that challenge was dismissed. So any new challenges will take a period of time. If there are any, I'm not sure if there has anything's been filed, but it takes at least five weeks to get through, uh, to be heard in front of an administrative judge. Uh, so right now, um, and there's been a lot of back and forth with the other uh, challenge that was heard by the uh, one of the courts and it's been appealed. And I'm not sure where that is in the system either. So any legal challenges are probably, um, very far off, but they have done. Uh, the, the, the governor is very clear, has made this order much clearer than previous orders. So. What's the current protocol for that Orange County is following for students of been ex known exposure? They're following this protocol that they're reading right there. Given the parent the right to. Yes. You let them go to school or quarantine them? Yes, I got a letter today that was outlining how they how the principals need to handle that. But yes, they're following the quarantine protocol. As I understand it, um, they are still considering their mask, their face covering mandate to October 30th. But they're still allowing them to choose whether or without? No, they're the, the quarantine, quarantine. The quarantine protocol where if you've been exposed. The parent can either have them go home and be quarantined for seven days. If they're asymptomatic, they can go back to class. So the OCPS is following the quarantine protocol. They, as I understand it, they're continuing with their the mask protocols that they had already approved uh, a month ago. And their um, parents are 90, it's somewhere between 92 and 95% pro mask protocol which is very different than where we are. Wait, with Orange County Public Schools, is 92 to 95% program? Yep. Wow. But if you have any questions about how we handle things, you know, like I said, Pam does a great job. Yes. Here. Um, but, you know, the, the item on the table is the, the, um, the order. And um, again, the corn bit, it was all meant to be, you know, in place last week, but because the commission had weighed in on a mask uh, mandate following OCPS. Uh, 
discussion needed to be had on this order in order to, to move forward. So that's why we're here tonight. Okay, so um, I would ask if we have any questions at the table about um, how we move forward with this. I want to say first before a question that I commend the staff, all the additional painstaking work you have put into this. I mean, I don't know the actual numbers, but it's, it shows that the average was 10 per week before, and now it's dropped to three per week. Yeah. So that's a 70%, 70% drop, and I'm really pleased and happy that you guys have put all that work in it. There's, the reward and the result is there that, you know, an average of seven kids less per week have got infected with COVID. And yeah, the question is because of wearing mask, you know, the drop because of wearing mask or not. That's, that's hard to say. I, mean, I don't I think there's a kind of mitigated that. situation. Yeah. You know, it kind of surprised me they gave them the option that the students been exposed either one it seems like it's been exposed you'd want them to quarantine and stay home before they go to school and expose themselves to other people and potentially spread it that's kind of confusing to me yep can you explain that a little bit more so the asymptomatic can go back mm -hmm. yes that's the new protocol yep and the new surgeon general yep of florida not sir. Florida. Florida. The, 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 the parent can make the choice whether they would like to pull them out to quarantine them for seven days because they've been exposed. But if they're asymptomatic and not showing any symptoms, um, they can, send, uh, if the parent agrees, they can send them back to class. Do they have to get tested and show the testing? No. No, that was, that's, I believe that was in the previous protocol. That's not nope. in the new protocol. Nope. The, the protocol is, is very specific, and that's what I put on the, yep. on the presentation. Yeah, that tree tells it all. That took them out of that tree. Joseph, can you say that again? I didn't hear. That tree tells it all how the options are. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, there's a, a, it's a big shift. Tree. It's a big shift. Yeah. Okay. Mike, do you have anything? Um, yeah, our question tonight becomes more than what we did the other day because there were moral issues and what we thought was right or wrong for the kids, whether we uh, let parents choose what's right for the kids or whether we dictate what's right for them. And we all know where we, where we stand on that. Um, now we come back to a legal decision. And first I'll say, I think Orange County is wrong in the fact that they can pick and choose pieces of a law. You either obey a law or you don't. You don't say, I like this part of it. So I'll do that. But I don't like this part, so I'm not going to do that. The, the law is the law is the law. And I guess I don't know about anybody else, but my parents taught me a right way and a wrong way if you need to try and change the law. The wrong way isn't to say, well, everybody else is breaking the law, so I think we can get away with doing it too, which is what we've done here. So we need to decide whether we're going to follow the law. And I mean all of it. Or we're going to say, no, we don't need it, and, and just break the law. Well, and I don't know, I don't know if they're just, you know, it's 30 days till they're done, you know, till they reconsider. And if they, you know, just are going to wait to reconsider it all at once. So it's just, I don't, I don't know. I'm surmising. Right. I, so, I don't know either what their thoughts are. Yeah. So I don't think we can, you know. Well, like you said, we, we don't. We didn't have to do it just because they did it last time. And it's just, okay, so, okay, never mind. So, but again, that's where we're here to decide, do we want to follow this order or don't we? So is, I think we're here to decide whether we want to stick with what we decided for masks. No, I, I don't see it as that, Mayor. I, I don't at all. I see it because masks incorporated in this whole order here. So if we say master mandatory and parents don't get to choose, 
then we also say that we don't have to follow the quarantine part of it either. Well, I haven't said, I hadn't gotten to that yeah. part yet. No, I'm just saying that's what. I'm not mean. saying, I'm not saying that. I'm saying we could choose tonight to leave masks in place and we could choose to follow the quarantine orders or not. We could, and we would be breaking the law. So are you saying that the Oakland, the, the, no, no, no. the Orange County Public Schools is breaking the law? Absolutely. Yes. yes. And Orange County is breaking the law. They're breaking so, the three laws. So we have to decide whether we want to break the law with them or whether we want to follow the law and follow it. If we don't agree with it, then we figure out how to go and lobby and do what we need to do to get someone to change the law. But it may, whether it's public safety, uh, it's public safety is public safety. You know, and I'll ask you this, Chief Peak, if the town of Oakland decides that we shouldn't go 35 miles an hour on, on uh, Oakland Avenue and you get the whole town to say, we're not going to do that, but we've already made that the law, what do you do? You get in trouble for that, don't you? You're going to stop. Well, we, we follow the laws on the books. However, uh, to your point, I think that's better as to the town attorney right. on what, yeah. their view on that. That's, my, that's where I'm going. That's what I'm going yeah. what, what council tells us to do. Is your question, can, can you phrase your, your question again to me? Because we've had kind of some back and forth. And My question is, I guess it's twofold. Is, is this a law right now? The emergency rule? Yes. The emergency rule is, is a valid law right now. It's okay. a valid agency regulation. So if we only follow part here, I'll cut to the chase. If we still say the masks are mandated, are we breaking the law? And that's a simple yes or no. Not complying with an agency regulation. Yes, that that is true as of right now. Yes. And did we not take our own oath to uphold the law? That's where we're at right now, because this made it all different. I don't know how it made it different, but we, what we did was break went, the law. Yeah, but why is it it's different now? We're still breaking the law. Well, that's why we're here, because they made other parts to it and put it all in together. That's what brought us back. They changed, they changed something, right. so it brings it back to the table. Right. So again, we have to decide whether we want to follow the law, not a piece of it, but follow the law or break the law. Which is what we did the last. Which is what we did the last. No, we didn't. I didn't. Well, you did. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I will right now make sure I state that. Okay. Um, gotcha. So. Gotcha. And I realize this is a hard situation for everyone and we're maybe on different sides of it, but the bottom line, once it got to this and the way they did the verbiage, um, it makes it even worse that we just continually break the law. And so, others the crap out of me too. Uh, attorney, if we have an option to vote to break the law, why do we even have that option? To say we would, we we're gonna vote to go against the 35 mile an hour. Why do we have an option to vote against that? I don't think we did. If we shouldn't have that option, why did we have it last time? The last time the law was being litigated when we had that emergency meeting. Thanks. So we did not break it. There were several, I wouldn't Thank say you. that we, I wouldn't say that we weren't in violation of that rule at that time. Okay, so for the record, we did not break the law, Mr. Vice Mayor. No, did we, we break were in violation. You say we did. Yes, we were <laughs> under litigation. But but because it was in litigation, they let it go through to see where it ended. The litigation. Yes. So we were monitoring those cases daily, hourly, and every time the judge made an order, every time a party filed a motion. I mean, it was. It is an ever changing area of law that we have to keep on monitoring. Not time for questions yet. Thank you. Calls? It's not time for questions yet. In, in, the, in the course of about two and a half weeks, we were compliant, not compliant, compliant, not compliant. Exactly. 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 Right. Right. We're not compliant today. So now where we're at today, 
you know, a, as a town or a school board, you do have the ability to challenge and as a citizen, which is what we were talking about there, but OCPS also was challenging this in a different arena. Um, you do have the opportunity to challenge a something that's put into place. So uh, it's not that you, you know, you can, especially when we're talking about something that's, you know, considered an emergency order. So that's the process we've been going through for the last month. There's nothing wrong with challenging something that the governor does or, or you know, the legislature does. Uh, but you have to, once it gets litigated, you got to live by it, you know. So, but right now, some of those challenges have, have dis dissipated. And the, the one that what happened um, is in limbo. And so right now, there's, there's none of those legal challenges that were uh, more prevalent at the time that you passed this. So that's really why we're here. Exactly, that's it. Mm -hmm. Those cases basically went away because the rule that those cases was based on was repealed and replaced by this new rule that we're discussing tonight. So that's why those cases were dismissed is because the court's saying, well, I'm not gonna issue a decision on a rule that doesn't exist anymore. So, so this, this emergency rule now kind of resets the discussion on where we're at. The positives that we have coming into tonight um, are that the numbers are down, that we've staff been doing a great job. Um, we've got a lot of positives to look at. So if you were to decide to follow this with the, and, and you know, it, it, this one has clear language as far as the facial coverings. So where, you know, before, when, when he first put out his executive order, it was completely voluntary. This one acknowledges the fact that you can mandate masks and require a written note from the, and we can put together a form, a written form with a signature from the parents that allows them to opt out. So you know, he's very clear in this where even the governor wasn't very clear with some of the, the things that were in, in the previous orders. So, you know, you've got some, some things there where you can continue with a mask mandate as long as you allow for a written, uh, written permission. The written permission signed by the parents, okay. Yes. Um, and that would uh, allow us to be compliant and continue with a, a face covering mandate. And are there any part of the new guidelines um, being litigated at all? I haven't seen challenges, but I'd imagine um, everybody's kind of got to get their stuff together. Yeah. And yeah, and, but I wouldn't be surprised if they, if they do come. And it's important for us to continue to follow that if there is a, another surge or a change in the situation, or we get to a point where things at the school get to uh, an emergency level, then you know, the, the commission is going to have to react to that uh, accordingly. So we need to be able to, to follow what's going on because you know, we're far from being out of the woods on this yet. So I think the answer, or answer to Mike's question was, it was being litigated at the time. Right. So and we were making our best judgment. Um, and this is based on children under 12 who are not eligible for a vaccine. So um, this is clear language. At the current time, it is not being litigated. I, I haven't seen the cases. Keep me honest. Right. If there are cases, then I haven't seen them. But I, I have looked and I haven't seen them. Okay. May I please add something to the discussion? No, you may not. You guys are missing HP 241. Well, we got to Hang on. You will have your three minutes. But it's and the it's the same. It's a different law, not the one you're talking about, but it's the same thing. You can't have this discussion without talking about it. Well, you can bring that up when, when you have uh, your three uh, minutes. You can bring it up when you have your three minutes. It's the parental bill of rights. Thank you. Everybody, everybody who wishes to speak will have three minutes to speak. So, but right now the discussion is at the table. So Anyway, thank you to the staff. I know you're making a heroic effort over there. You've been doing it since last year and we appreciate it. So, um, secondly, I did have a thought, I got derailed. Um,
And when it comes back to me, <laughs> I know, I, I'm trying to. Like, <laughs> I got derailed. I'm sorry. Um, so I, I, I really do believe that, you know, things have changed and we're stepping back, looking at what's changed and taking a look at what we think we should do now. And may I remind everybody that this is only in place until November 9th. It's not like we have put this in place for perpetuity. So, um, and I also would like to thank Sal for his donation of clear children's masks so they can see each other's faces. You know what problem I have with that? Let me tell you what problem I have with that. You didn't make any of them Batman masks in the big enough size. <laughs> yeah. You want a Grateful Dead mask. Yeah. I wore Batman. <laughs> I don't know if I can find a big enough mask. Hey, 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 hey. Okay. <laughs> I got that. <laughs> All right. Do we have any further thoughts at the table? Because I, I just got one comment. Yes, or comments. You know, we, we've never blamed the staff for anything. So I want to make that clear. To, I mean, you know, the staff is caught in the middle of all this. So right. there's never any issue or any concern with the staff. We just want to make sure everyone's safe. So um, the staff was never part of the conversation about this being an issue. Um, it's all about, you know, you know, we're dealing with a pandemic. We're dealing with laws and just want to make the right decisions. So, um, you know, I just want to make sure that we, we clear all that out. It's not anyone trying to pick sides. We just been trying to do the best we can with the, the data that was in front of us at the time. So correct. I, I agree with that. And I appreciate you saying that at our <laughs> you know, commissioner because the staff is made uh, gone a million miles in a really impossible situation whichever yeah. side of this you're on exactly. they were in an impossible and still are, in still, impossible still are yeah. so yeah. thank you for bringing yeah. that up yeah. and you know this is this is we're never always going to agree on everything no. that's that's what makes um that that's what gets you to hopefully the best decision you can make mm -hmm different points of view. No, I agree. All okay. right. I, got, I got a big mouth again. I'm being you. No, 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 no. I don't have. <laughs> All right. I am not. I'm not. I'm just happy that the results of what, I mean, no matter what facts or what truths each one brings up here to the podium, the fact is that seven less kids per week don't have. Right. Exposed. That's to me is, is, is already a win, no matter what we decide today. Well, I said in the very beginning, I think, and I started it with that, that the, the whole, the saddest part of this whole thing is that we are all on the same side if we want the best, no matter what uh, the rules are, everyone wants what's best for these kids. I mean, and that That's is, right. so whichever way we went, you're right, uh, Sal, that, um, you know, that goes down and whether it's a mask, whether it's just a decline in the Delta, whatever it is, you know, we're going in the right direction and that's the win. So. And like I said, I would, you know, I would not have any problem being embarrassed last next year if I, you know, was accused of overreacting. I, I don't like being accused of being disgusting, but being overreacting is okay. Um, so anyway, do we have any further comments at the table? Okay. So I am going to hold on a motion based on the fact that I think we'll, we will have comments and I'd like to take those comments before the motion is made. Yes, sir. All right. And let me be clear, <laughs> three minutes. We went and got a timer. <laughs> wow. <laughs> In so, our history, that's the first time. <laughs> I know. You know, and every other municipality does it on a regular basis. I see that. So anyway, um, who in the building would like to make comment? Okay. Please uh, state your name clearly and, and if you would sign in on the, the uh, form there, please. Yes, sir. My name is James Avalon. Proud president of Open Floor Cup. Welcome, James. Thank you, guys. He has a win. Hold on a second, right now. 
What's your name, at least? What time right? Let's start with Jenna. Start with the timer. Um, listen, guys, I didn't come here with uh, facts. I don't have anything crazy to present. I don't have crazy numbers because we all have skewed numbers here and there. No one really knows a ton of these numbers themselves, like the 92 to 93% from the Orange County School Board, where that number come from for mass uh, approval. Who knows? Right. Make believe numbers. We're all throwing them out there. I just want to talk. Well, that one did come from Orange County. Minutes. I just want to talk on behalf of a lot of the mothers here. Um, you know, not a lot of the fathers step up to have these conversations. Uh, a gentleman in the back is trying his best. Uh, I want to speak on behalf of the teachers, right, and on behalf of our children. Uh, it's just in that's mind I think that we're going to be a board of people here that's going to decide the fate of our kids that are very young to have to be forced to wear a mask, right? I mean, I know we all know this, we all agree with it, that it seems crazy to think if we ask any of the teachers that these three-year-old, four-year-olds, five-year-olds, six-year-olds are going to keep a mask on uh, during school throughout the day. Um, you made a comment earlier that you think maybe that we've had, now that we're at zero cases right now, that maybe the mask being effective had taken part in that. Well, of course they have not. Go to the school and have any of you been to school and sat for a day and watched them with their masks on? Has anyone, can you raise your hand if you've been to the school since you uh, issued this mandate? Not so no one has been to the school? Okay, go watch the car drop off line. No one's wearing a mask because they can't. You're putting more pressure on the teachers. It is impossible. It's impossible. Does anyone here have school age children that are in that school? Nobody does. No, they do. So you're the only person here in this whole board that decides our children's fate. Only one of us has a child in that school that decides what's going to happen. When was, when was the last time someone here had a child under the age of 12, right? Has it been a while? Okay, I know we have some. No, I'm raising eight year old grandchildren as, as children. Are they forced to wear masks at their school? Um, they are, but they have the, what that thing says there with the parent, okay to. Right, yeah, so I have a college student. She has to wear a mask. Okay, and my son, being five, who's at the school, has a very hard time keeping it on, just like every other student there. And I would encourage you guys to go to the school and watch and see how difficult it is, because we're wasting time and we're traumatizing kids over this for no reason. Um, we all know that COVID is not killing children by the masses. Everyone knows that, right? No one knows what the exact number is, but it's not killing children by the masses. I know you're worried, worried about infection and taking this back to infecting other people, but this is our individual health choice. We're not here. To, this is not about protecting the children because these kids are not dying in this. They're getting sick. They're getting a positive case. They're going home, waiting. We can come back to school. It's not about that. I'm really disheartened that none of you have visited the school. I keep going back to that because that's really irritating to me that you would vote this in and then not even follow up, especially when you would know, I don't know what the numbers that say 90% or 92, 93% of the teachers don't support the mass mandates. They don't want them because it's just another problem for them to deal with. And it's not helping anyone because these kids are using them to play with, throw around and one of the teachers told me the biggest issue is making sure the kid goes home with the right mask at the end of the day. I see the time. Thank you. I don't really need to discuss the order. Uh, the gentleman here went over it pretty well. We already know what the rule is and what the order is standing for the state of Florida, that we do have the right to sign off on our kids not having to wear a mask. And 55% of us already said that that's what we want. And all I'm asking is that you consider that because that's what we want. The ones that want to send their kids with a the mask, they already have that choice. You're eliminating our choice. They will have their choice to send their children with a mask, and we just want our choice to be able to send them without it. That's all. Guys, please take the time to go visit the school, talk to the principal, talk to any of the teachers, and uh, make sure you see that this is not working, it's not effective, and it's a waste of time. Cool. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, anybody else in the building who would like to make a comment? Okay. <laughs> Come on up. Take two. <laughs> <laughs> you can start right where you're at. So. We won't we won't ding you for the other time. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, I know you had mentioned it's only until November 9th, but until November 9th, it is illegal. So I know he brought some of the emotion about parents and teachers. I'm going to bring more facts, which you may not know all of them, but statutes in accordance to Florida state constitution and requirement for school boards to follow law here in applicable statutes. Um, 1001.42 section 15 enforcement of law and rules require that all laws and rules of the state board of education or the district school board are properly enforced. 101 or 1001.51 section 14, enforcement of laws and rules require that laws and rules of the state board of education, as well as supplementary rules of the district, the district school board are properly observed and report to the district school board 
any violation that the district school sub superintendent does not succeed in having corrected. Statute pursuant to Governor's Executive Orders 252.36, Emergency Management Powers of the Governor, uh, 1B, pursuant to the authority vested in her or him under paragraph A, the governor may issue executive orders, proclamations, and rules, and may amend or rescind them. Such executive orders, proclamations, and rules shall have the force and effect of law. Executive Order 21-175, ensuring parents' freedom to choose masks in schools. Section 1, I hereby direct the Florida Department of Health and Florida Department of Education working together to immediately execute rules. This is as complete as of today, mm -hmm. um, pursuant to section 120.54 Florida statutes and take any additional agency action necessary using all legal means available to ensure safety protocols for controlling the spread of COVID-19 in schools that one, do not violate Floridians' constitutional freedoms, two, do not violate parents under the Florida law to make healthcare decisions for their minor children, and three, protect children with disabilities um, such as face mask requirements. Any action pursuant to section one above shall at minimum be in accordance with Florida's Parents' Bill of Rights and protect parents' right to make decisions regarding masking of their children in re uh, relation to COVID-19. Um, there is so much more I wish I could say, but I only have 40 seconds. <laughs> um, basically, um, local officials do not have standing in the courts to address the state's constitutional laws. Therefore, uh, school boards must assume state or constitutional public officials are being obligated by law to obey laws set forth by the state legislature. Again, you make a rule. If you guys aren't going to follow it, we're not setting a good example for our children. I'm sorry. That's just wrong. The Supreme Court effectively ruled the rules of the governor and legislators implement are lawful and within our constitution, and they cannot be challenged by local officials. Failure to comply with state law is as written by executive order, um, which you can look up. I'll make this fast. Article 4, Section 7A. Um, the governor may suspend from office any state official or officer, um, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, you can look up that part as well. But I just want everybody to do the right thing. And no, they are not working in school anyway. We had zero cases this week. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else in the building? And before I start, I too want to thank the teachers and Ms. Dwyer, especially um, you guys who have a job. And I think you get a lot of stuff placed that you're and not intentionally, but you take stuff you shouldn't be taking. I know where you guys stand. I know you were begging the council to not implement that. So thank you again to the staff for ACS. I'm Terry Fletcher. My son is a third grader at OACS. Again, this is his third year, three out of his first four years dealing with COVID. Okay. So I'm not even going to focus on the facts about the mask because last time it was clear you guys don't care about the facts. I dropped off 32 studies. You didn't read any of them. So this time I'm going to lay them here as exhibits if we can. There's 47 studies that prove masks are ineffective, 32 that prove you're actually harming our children. Okay. So the count commission is not only violating the rules 64 DER 2112, the previous one, and the new one 15, you're violating HB 241, the Parents' Bill of Rights, specifically Chapter 1014, Florida Statutes under the Florida K-20 Education Code, the Governor's Executive Order 21175, signed by the Governor in order to prevent rogue school boards and local politicians, such as yourself, from subverting the, excuse me, the Parents' Bill of Rights, this order was uh, upheld by the appellate court on the 10th of September 21, ruling by the First District Court of Appeal, which I said at the last meeting would probably happen. You're in violation of the Nuremberg Code, and you're even in violation of the OACS dress code, believe it or not. So again, I don't know what it is that you guys get like this power that you can violate the law, but if you're not gonna follow the laws, we're not either. So we can just send our kids to school and say, screw your laws. Like, I, I don't understand this, this whole stance. It, there, there's no science behind it. There's no laws behind it. You're actually violating the law. 
And yeah, I've got cops coming at me because I'm talking too loud at a meeting telling you you're violating the law. So if you go ahead and go through with this, I'm telling you, I'm going to file suit against you and I'm going to get 55% of the school to follow me. I'm done playing this game. Like you can sit and talk down to me and laugh at me all you want, but we're fed up with this. We're tired of this. Unmask our kids. It is against the law. You are abusing our children. You are suffocating them and we've had enough of it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, anybody else in the building? Okay, do we have any hands raised from afar? Yes, Mayor, we have one, uh, Flavio. Flavio, can you hear us? One, two, three of them. Oh, and Hello? we have two after that. So you... we'll start with Flavio, you have three minutes. Uh, okay, we do without video this one? You, you don't okay. want to see my face? <laughs> <laughs> he controls that, doesn't he? Yeah. Okay. He, don't you control There you that. go. Okay. We can see you. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to address a little elephant in the room that nobody has addressed it first. Guys, OCPS, I'm talking to you, mayor and commissioners. OCPS is a polit it's political. OCPS is everything about, you know, Demons versus uh, DeSantis and all that stuff. We are not political. We are Oakland. You guys are nonpartisan. We don't have to, we need to make that difference because OCPS has a political fight. We all know it. Nobody's going to say that. I know you will, you will not agree with me on, on this uh, recording, but deep inside, you know. Having said that, uh, everything they, that my the other parents told about uh, obeying the law, I think that is number one. Uh, you know, we really need to set up an example, and that is obeying the law day after day. That's what we do. And we don't break it. We obey it. But more than that, I would like to point that um, during the, the last two months, several courts in Florida have conceded injunction orders for allowing parents to make a decision of wearing the, their, their kids wearing a mask or not. And all of those injunctions were conceded based on three facts. Number one, it is not acceptable to adopt a policy that may harm a single child. So one, two, three, 10, 20, doesn't matter. If a policy has the potential to harm one child, it is not acceptable. Now, number two, it is a proven fact, and you can go through these decisions. I can send it to you later. Uh, all the judges analyzed cases that were brought as proof and with medical proof that children are harmed by masks. Not all of them, but some of them and you know, from point one, you know that we only need one to make this unacceptable. And three, this is very important. Most of the harm starts in a subclinical level, which means that we need to allow a child to be harmed and harmed and harmed up to the point that she's, she or he is so harmed that needs a doctor to get a note to opt out. So that is really not acceptable because with, with only the medical note, which the, was the decision you gave us last time, you have to go through a lot of suffering to get a medical examination. But what was proven in court is that most cases are subclinical and that should be enough to not enforce a mask mandate. So I'm just saying that we cannot have a policy that harms a child. That's it. On top of everything that everyone said. So I beg the mayor and the commissioners to hold your, you know, we did a prayer here. Now, isn't it the same Bible that says that we should abide by the laws that our government lays out? That is God speaking also. Okay, and, and, and can, you're you're past your three minutes. So can I just conclude? Can we finish up, please? 
20 seconds to wrap up. Uh, sorry, are you kidding me? So I was just going to say that it, it, it's the law. We have to abide it. And if you guys want to challenge it, let's do it in court, not with our kids. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Natalie Poston, you are next. Can we on? Hi, can you hear me? We can hear you. Um, okay. We can see you. There we Hold go. On. Oh, hey. There you are. <laughs> um, my name is Natalie Poston. Um, my daughter goes to Oakland Avenue. She's in kindergarten this year. Um, and I'm also a nurse. I work at Dr. Phillips Hospital. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think I don't have anything really long or intensive to say other than um, just give us the choice. <laughs> um, I think up to this point, us parents have really felt like, you know, we have been told what we are supposed to be doing. And the parents that are in favor of masking have really had all the rights in this. Right. Um, and then the parents that just want the choice. We're sitting back here saying, give us a choice, give us a choice, give us a choice. And there's, there's no opportunity for that. So, um, sorry, I'm getting a little shaky. Um, I guess what I'm, what I'm asking for is just a choice. That's it. If parents want to mask their kids, fantastic. That's good for them. If parents don't want to mask their kids, just give us the opportunity. Um, Mayor, I know you said that right now we're talking about masks that it's only going to go to November 9th. Well, that's what we thought March last year. They said, oh, we're only going to be in quarantine for two weeks. And here we are a year and a half later still talking about this. Um, so I think from our perspective, yes, it may sound like it's only until November 9th, but historically this has lasted much, much longer than that. Um, I would also like to say, I know that you guys mentioned um, that some of the numbers may be dropping because you think that the masks are working and the certain protocols that we're using are working. Um, I, like I said, I work in a hospital um, our peak numbers last year at Dr. Phillips Hospital in particular, or Orlando Health in general, were in the 300s last year. This last month, we peaked in the 700s. Our numbers doubled from what we thought was horrible last year. It's been twice as worse this year. I don't know if you've heard of just all the nursing shortages and all of the troubles that we're facing, but our masking policies never changed. We, we follow the exact same protocols we did last year, that we are following this year, but yet the number of COVID patients doubled, over doubled. So does that mean that the masks worked? Not according to the data that we're seeing. That's in the adult population, obviously, but I think the same principle can apply to what we're seeing in the schools and such. Um, I just wanna say one more thing in regards to the quarantine. Um, I'm exposed every single day to COVID patients. I see COVID patients die every single day. Um, does that mean because I'm exposed every single day that I'm not allowed to work now? I'm the sole breadwinner for my family. So if that meant that I was not able to work, that would be a huge problem, right? So I think once again, it goes back to just allowing parents, give them the choice. There might be a reason that they need their child to go to school every day. And if that child is asymptomatic, allow them to go to school. Um, I think that's all I need to say. Thank you. Um, I appreciate this discussion. Um, the last Thing I want to say is sorry I keep saying I'm going to end and then I keep talking um oh it's my time I'm sorry I'll finish right now um I would like to just say I know mayor you mentioned that 92 to 95 percent of people in um Orange County were pro-mask um a hundred percent of the parents in this room are anti-mask so take that as my final say um and just give us the choice thank you for your time Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, so Brett Ford, you're next. All right, good evening. Um, I could uh, I could kind of piggyback on her last comments. Uh, hey, um, can we see your face? I'm probably not. It's like a really, I'm in a really dark room. I don't know if you'll be able to see me actually. I could try. Yeah, go for it. All right, we're good. There you go. There, here I am. <laughs> um, Thank you very much. No problem. Um, so I ran. Uh, I, I've been running 
the weekly count of numbers, Orange County versus Lake County, as we know, or maybe you, you don't know, Lake County has an opt-in uh, requirement for their mask mandate. They have it like if a school gets over 5% positivity, they require the masks, but they still allow the parents to opt out. Um, so generally speaking, they have an opt-out policy. Orange County does not. So since the beginning of the year, I'm looking at uh, the weekly count at the beginning of the year for Orange County. The total count was close to about 1,500 positive for the first week. The most recent week, it went down to 406. That's a drop of 72%, and that's with no mask opt-out. Lake County, first week of the year, that 604. Most recent week, 147. That's a drop of 76% with an opt-out. Um, so the data is clear right there. It doesn't show that the masks did anything since one school district had an opt-out and one didn't, and the one that did have an opt-out actually performed a little better. Um, you know, I'm not saying that because they had an opt-out, they did better, but it just goes to show that, you know, what difference does it really make? Um, and to chime in on, or piggyback on what some of the other comments said, you know, we're asking or we're making our kids um, wear a mask, even though they may not like it. I think one of the teachers told my kids, you know, you may not agree with the rule, but it's the rule, so you have to do it. Um, so I don't even know why we're having this conversation here because there's a rule in place and we have to follow the rule and it will set a terrible example if the school board goes against that rule. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, I can't see your name. It just says iPhone. Um, that's you. Yeah. Hello, is that me? Long dark hair, blue shirt. Hi. Hi, Hi. Mayor, Mayor, sure, it's Heather Byler. Uh, Mayor okay. Stark and the commissioners who voted to protect our kids at the last emergency meeting, thank you so much. I am um, very grateful and I've been meaning to send an email to all of you because the peace you've given me as a mother and as a parent um, is a gift. And protecting my kids is really all I could ask of my government. Uh, security is one of the greatest things that we receive from our government, national, local, the police force. And now we have to ask it for our kids because we're in the middle of a pandemic. Living through history is not fun. It's fun to read about it, but this is not fun for anyone. And I appreciate that there are perspectives on both sides. I don't pretend to be an epidemiologist, a virologist, an infectious disease doctor, but I sure listen to those who are. And for the first time in history, we're now looking at parents to be public health experts, and we're not. Sure, we know our kids best, but if we're going to teach science at the school, we should sure practice it. So thank you again to the folks who have voted to protect our kids. I did not expect to be in this situation just a few weeks later. I didn't leave the last meeting feeling good. It's, it's not a fun time, I think, to be dealing with this. I know that the School has had heartache to go along. Um, but again, protecting my kids is, and the extended community around us, because that's really a large part of what this is, is uh, it's just one of the greatest functions of what government can do. And when it goes to you know parents teaching us, my parents taught me that it is a pound of cure. My parents taught me that you stand up weak. It's actually one of the uh, commandments is to do that. And our children are certainly in that category right now when they have no other choice, but that thin, thin mask, there is no choice for them to get vaccinated at this point. And before this meeting, I was just on a WebEx conference call with Nemours and their infectious disease and pediatrician uh, experts. And they're talking about, these are the people who are studying it, taking care of the patients in the hospital, that they don't know what the long-term risks of this are even in asymptomatic cases, if you lose your sense of, and this is nearly a direct quote, hearing, excuse me, smell or taste, the virus has invaded your nervous system. I don't want my kids walking around West Orange High School a decade from now, discovering what they have as a result of my community failing to protect them. Doing the right thing in history, if you look back, has never been easy. And that's again why I owe a debt of gratitude to you who have done it. It's never been easy to stand up for what's right. 
And that's what we're asking you to do, to continue to do. Thank you. Thank you. Tracy Austin. I think I'm missing somebody to the left. I'll get to you right after Tracy. I'm sorry. Um, good evening, guys. Um, I do agree with Natalie as well. My husband and I are both um, public service workers and work for fire departments and are exposed every day. Every day I get an email saying how many patients the day before I was exposed to and none of us are sent home on quarantine. Quarantine. They just tell us to kind of watch our symptoms. If we become symptomatic, then don't show up to work. Um, I do have three kids as well. Um, one is severely immune compromised due to kidney transplant. One is, and two of them are completely healthy. The one that is uh, immune compromised wears a mask 100% of the time. She doesn't have a problem wearing a mask. And I don't have a problem with others wearing a mask if that's how they feel protected. And that's what makes them feel safe. I have no problem with that whatsoever. I have one that doesn't wear a mask at all and pretty much refuses to. And then I have a second grader who has to follow what we say, different rules for different occasions. If any of you guys have been out and about in the town the last couple of weeks since this mask mandate at school has been put in place, if you're out on a Saturday or Sunday or even after school, you see that most of these kids in stores, uh, farmers markets at practices outside, Girl Scout meetings inside, Boy Scout meetings, none of them were wearing masks. They're wrestling, they're hugging each other, they're playing ball, they're, you know, swapping sweat, swapping spit, who knows whatever. So yes, I do applaud the school this week for not having zero cases by all means. I definitely think they're doing a great job, but it's not the school that is causing these issues. It would be the outside community that we're in. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Elise, I can't read her name. Yeah, she Anna got her Rodriguez. hand up? Oh, hello. Yeah, Anna Rodriguez. Anna Rodriguez, I'm sorry. I didn't see your hand up. <laughs> no problem. It's Zoom life now. We just get used to it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what I'd like to say, uh, just two things, just for thought, is that the vaccination for kids uh, between five and 11 is coming soon. So if we could not confuse the kids with the politics that's going around it, and they, they have the mandate now and they're doing it. If we can wait until vaccines are available for kids their age to remove the mandate or to make it optional, that would like not compromise the, the ones that are already there and already know how to use it. So, so many kids, when you go on the streets and you see the kids without a mask playing, they are not playing in a, for five hours straight in a closed room with the other ones. So there is this option that, yes, you can go outside and see kids without a mask and they are not catching anything. Yes, but they are not together with each other for five hours, six hours a day. And with an adult that can also be compromised if they're in there. Uh, the other thing I was going to say, we have been told, uh, ah, okay, somebody was talking about how the, like, we are being told, we are not supposed to be told what to do with our kids and how to parent by the state. We have been told by the state what to do with our kids from the beginning since they are born. That's why they're in school right now. That, that like, because school exists for a reason and there's uh, laws in place for things that you can and you can't do with your kids. So having the rule being taken because I'm not having the option of having my kids wear it or not wear it because the state's mandating. Yes, the state is mandating it. Like we can't tell the kids to wear it or not. It's levels of authority. They do have the authority of recasting something like that. But right now, our governor have signed a law have signed a, a rule stating that mask, a ban on mask mandates, which doesn't mean that it can be appealed. So while we are discussing this, why not let the kids stay with the mask from let's say until November and when they can be vaccinated or the rules can be appealed or not, then we reassess and decide again what we're gonna do from now on. Uh, okay, and also just to finish, 100% of the parents in the room are anti-mask 
and that is a, there's a reason for that. No parents that really are pro-mask would be in a closed room when there is an option of watching and participating online, a safe option. So there are lots of parents that are pro-mask, they are not in the room because it's the best decision is not to be in the room if you have the option not to be there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Kate Ionelli. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Kate Ionelli. I'm a parent and doctor of clinical psychology. Um, I just I have a few brief things to say. It's really simple. We've learned a lot from the science. Um, I follow the science. I'm a scientist. This is what I do. We know for a fact that masks do not prevent the spread of COVID. We know for a fact that children are more likely to die of the flu than of COVID. We know for a fact that masks are damaging physically, psychologically, academically, and socially. We know for a fact that the majority of OACS parents want an opt-out option. If you continue to vote for a non-opt-out option, you know that it is not in the best interest of the majority of the children and the families. We can only presume that this is politically based. We won't know the long-term damage of mask wearing on children for years to come. Never in the history of the United States of America have, been ch have children been sacrificed for the benefit of adults. Why are we choosing to allow our children to be sacrificed when we know that masks are damaging? Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Courtney Diaz. Diaz. I'm standing in for Courtney. My name is Christopher Diaz. Um, I think uh, we, we've heard a lot already. Um, pros, cons, all those pieces. My, my sons uh, started flag football this past weekend. They're in on the field, literally face-to-face, -to -face, touching each other, grabbing each other with their classmates, no masks. Um, this is, one of the parents mentioned stopping by the school. I take notice every day when I come through Carline and I see so many students without masks. Uh, whether they received a medical waiver or whatever, besides the point, I think all in all, at the end of the day, at this moment right now, it's clearly understood by what was already presented and provided tonight, that at this moment, it's illegal to be mandating a mask without a parent opt-out. That's clear, it's written, it's it's said, it's it's done, it's in ink, and there are, one's already mentioned it, and there are plenty more who are standing by ready to have litigation if this is going to continue to be a problem because our rights are being squished right now. And we are stepping up respectfully at this moment in time to say, please stop. Please stop breaking the law that you guys are acknowledging is in place. That should be effective immediately, not waiting. There shouldn't be a November 9th thing. There shouldn't be anything like that. This is an opt out that should be available to the parents immediately. If you want to wear a mask, by all means, do so, do so. I'm not harping on you for choosing to wear a mask. Do not push back on us for choosing not to. That's all I have to say. I appreciate it. Thank you for the time. Thank you. All right, I do not see any other hands. Okay, I'm gonna bring it back to the table. And the first thing, and Steve, keep me honest here, and the lawyer, please. Um, we have a few options here and um, a little less than in Robert's rules because we usually don't find ourselves in this kind of situation. Um, we could take no action tonight and leave in place what we voted on a couple of weeks ago and let the other part that's new stand, correct? I, I would think so, um, de defer to Yes. Okay. We can vote to follow the new mandates. Mandate, the right word? Yes. Okay, 
We can vote to follow both new mandates effective immediately. Um, can you explain that first part again, Mayor? Can you explain that first part again in terms we of- We do nothing. We do nothing. Okay. Nothing, we just do nothing, leave in place what we have done, except the second mandate that was put in place in the interim for the quarantining. Quarantine, yeah, except part of it, you're saying. Well, we leave in place what we said about masks okay. and we accept the other part. Okay, so again, we're only gonna accept part of this mandate. Right. Okay. Yeah. So you're saying the options. You go the I'm options. just going through yeah. the options. Yeah. options. You go through the options. The option is illegal. <laughs> um, we can vote to um, see now I'm derailed again. Sorry. <laughs> that wasn't you. Sorry. Um, uh, we can vote to accept both mandates effective immediately, which is what has come down and continue to watch what happens in the courts as we go along and does it change. And then we're right back here again in these very, very volatile situations, trying to do right by the kids. Is there a third option? I think you get three. You what, get three. What, what, is, no. what litigation are you waiting on? Uh, whatever, whatever goes through the courts. But there's a law that's gone through our state. Uh, so, uh, well, they challenged the last one, so. Order, Laws can be challenged. Statutes can be challenged. Agency rules can be challenged. City codes can be challenged. Things can be challenged. So anyway. You're a lawyer, right? Yes. It's our city lawyer. I said city. Um, but discussion is back at the table. Um, so rules on Roberts or, a, you know, a reminder of Roberts rules. Any commissioner can make a motion. That motion can die if there is not a second. So, you, you know, you can make a motion up or down. There's no second, then we try again. So that is, you know, all of your rights. Do I have the Roberts rules rights? Uh, yeah, it looks so. Okay. I just want to clarify just a couple things as okay. you start to, to you know think about um, a motion. So if we do go with following the emergency rule 64 DER 21-15, um, part of that is including the parental opt-out form. So it's right. something that we would need to disseminate and publish. So would we make this effective immediately or should we make it effective say on Thursday? And we'll publish the form tomorrow and the kids can start bringing them in on Thursday. If that works for Pam administratively. But we already signed them. We're not taking public comment. Thank you. Just trying to see the time. What is the question that I'm being asked? Administratively, if we voted to opt out masks, how much time do you need? As far as the, the publishing the form and having the turn in. It's online. How much time do you need? If you're for a form to be made, I could have a form made tomorrow morning if that's the direction. So the, the, the direction that, that you've discussed, form to be made as, as soon as I can do it when I get home, if that's what you want to do. So would you want to would you want to make it effective tomorrow or effective on Thursday? Give everybody a chance to get the form and bring them in. I think that those that I had. I, 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 I'm just looking at what, what's... Me, to me, if we're going to do it, I just, if we're going to, if we're going to allow for opt out, make that available tomorrow. What the clarity that I want to make sure that everyone understands is that I know we're talking about, we, we legitimately had an electronic form 
Right, but I know that we, we want to follow specifically what Governor DeSantis said, and it's an opt out form and with a parent signature. So that's what's in the in the rule. So I think we just need to follow that specifically and for resetting. So how much time do you need, Pam? I can legitimately push on the form this evening. People bring it tomorrow, they bring it tomorrow. And if not, they're out of compliance. I mean, that's just like, and we'll just, we would basically just hand a child a mask like we're doing now. We have people yeah. that come to school without a mask and we say, put it on, you know what I mean? And, and, and nine times out of 10, the child, you know, cooperates because they're a child. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I just wasn't trying to drop this on you no. if, if you needed the data to get organized. And we just don't, don't want to, we want to make sure administratively it's not burdensome. With all due respect, I think that no matter what, if there's a form or not a form, there's going to be barriers tomorrow. It, it's not, you know, you know, like that's all I'm saying. Like, there's going to be something tomorrow that's going to take my time in relationship to this if there's not a form. So I'll do the, I'll make the form and, and be done with this. Does that, does that make sense, what I'm saying? Listen, is this a new form or can the original opt-outs that we already signed together yeah, so a year there? It. I think that what the belief, what the understanding of the law is, what can look good on That's, thing. yeah, that's a- said that there needs to be an actual signature on there. And so that's a technicality. There, they, I do believe that there are electronic signatures in there, but I don't, we want to go in this direction. And that's What's that? Was there a particular template provided through this? Like, no, there was not. So we just need to create. I think there was template. one that was put out there early with the last order. Okay. You know, when they when they did decide that opt out was fine with the governor. It's very simple. So I think we just and you know it's, it's asking for a form. So I think we just need to follow with. Sure. You know what what they said. So, um, but if if that's the direction, you know, first of all, just making sure. So effective immediately would be fine, or effective first thing tomorrow. And then the other thing is uh, staff, uh, making sure that we're clear that whether you want to have staff follow the same protocols or whether you want me to decide uh, what the staff protocols are going to be moving forward. Uh, both quarantine and masking, because uh, this order does not cover teachers and staff. I can get with Pam and Noreen, and we can work through a policy for staff and disseminate that in the next couple of days. Uh, but I just want to make sure we're clear with staff um, also. Generally, I would have that. You would have that authority. authority. Decisions I have for the town. Um, I do need to look at what our current policy with the town, both quarantine and mask, and and I can push something out, you know, between now and the end of the week. So um, I just want to make sure we're clear with that. So I've, I've got something written out if that's the direction you want to go, if you want to look at other options, however, however you'd like to handle it. I, I, I think that'll be, we'll put that in the motion, but it, consistently we let you handle those. Right. Those things. So um, we do nothing. We accept both, or we keep the mask option in place. Those, I think, are our our choices. Correct? Yes. Well, if if we do nothing, then the current mask rule that we have in place, place be, it's yes, would same remain. thing. Mm -hmm. Yes. Except for the quarantine additional. Right. If we if we do nothing, then we are not adopting the standard set out in the new rule. If if we do nothing, so we would be um, violating the new rule. We would have a quarantine procedure that would be different from that provided in the. So there are three options. Okay. Yeah, so it would be uh, to accept the. Uh, the, the quarantine part of the procedure and not the mask part of it. It's not worth What's our current quarantine procedure if the student is exposed? It was based off of the previous Department of Health order that came out on August 6th. And Pam can elaborate on it. So currently we actually are following another 
already following an emergency health department order for the quarantine levels that we're currently doing. And that is um, a child can test uh, from exposure sick on the, after the fourth day to the fifth day, can test to see if they're negative and return on the fifth day. If the parent chooses not to test an individual, then they can return on the um, eighth day um, without a test. Okay. Even that rule has to be done within the parent's bill of rights. So even the old rule has to Okay, be done. but if they are exposed, whether symptomatic or asymptomatic, yes. they can't come back to school until after the certain amount of days. Correct. Correct. And that's where we've had almost 400 or a little over 400 isolations or quarantines because of following that rule. So we, is there another option here then? We could lift the mask, but stick to the quarantine, right? So <laughs> if you need to remember that we're restricting children from attending school. Yeah, don't we yeah. don't like that idea. He, like I said, he has tightened up on, on some of the language on this. So. Yeah. So, uh, council, which one of these options or any of these options that we take, will they put us in violation of the new rule? And is it illegal what we're going to be doing if we make a motion to accept on the table to pick one of those options? There are options in the table, on the table, that would result in us not complying with the agency regulation. And um, your is your second question, what would happen? No, what's the, what? which one is the option that does not put us? Uh, the option to, if you wanna avoid violating the agency rule at all, then the option would be to adopt their policies. Exactly. So the, we would have a parental opt-out for the mask mandate, and we would follow the quarantine procedures set forth in the. So, with anything other than accepting the new rules, there is risk involved. Mm -hmm. So, can you tell me some of that risk if we do violate it? Are we going to be challenged? Are we going to have to um, fight this till November 9th? Or mm -hmm, you will. We will. Yeah. It is conceivable that the Department of Health could try to take some action to enforce its rule against us. Um, it's also entirely conceivable that this rule will be challenged and that the challengers are going to go to court and say that the rule itself is illegal. So okay. it is it is going to be evolving and I we all we can do is keep our eye on what's going through the courts. Okay. Any other questions? All right. All right. Somebody needs to make a motion. I will make the motion and effective immediately. We follow exactly emergency rule 64 DER 21-15. And then decide if you're all right with the, uh, yeah, I guess. Um, knowing that parents have to sign the mask update, not electronically, but on, on paper. Um, along with that, we give uh, the town manager along with the principal to the end of the week to make uh, a policy for teachers and staff at the school to follow. That covered. That's my motion. Okay, I need a second. I want to say something before I make my decision, Mr. Vice. I'm really saddened that the citizens think that this is uh, polit politicized by us, or at least not by me, deep down inside. I really, really care for the children. I can care less about the politics, really. I never got into this seat because of the division of politics that above us. I really care for the, the, the students. And I, I care for the staff too, what you've been going through, Pam, and all your staff below you. And, uh, and I don't wanna be breaking the rule. That's it. 
and and I'm and I'm saddened that we have to get to this point that we even have to be throwing around the, the word of God here in the Bible and and really no empathy. Love your neighbor as yourself. And I don't see sacrifice, but I will let I'll second your motion, Vice. Thank you. I agree with Sal. But I I Sal, you couldn't have said it better. I'm 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 this is not political. This is about the children, and I'm tired of fighting about it. And I hope that I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong. The law is the law, man. So you don't 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 just lost the law. Yep. <laughs> And I, I, you know, this could be challenged. City of, of town attorney, I can't believe I keep calling you a city attorney. Yeah, um, really, you and we may find ourselves back here in two weeks. Exactly. Yes. Well, so I'm tired. I'm tired of fighting about it. And I, I'm, I'm happy that the results came in, whether people believe it or not. I'm pleased. I'm so happy. That's what I'm going to take home tonight. Yes. That. Seven less kids per week for getting it. And I know it was a hard work, Pam. And I, again, I commend the staff, all the additional painstaking work you guys have done. And the law is the law. And Vice Mayor, I wasn't talking about your task was kind of big. So, just and, I, and let me just say this on personally for the, for the four of you guys. I trust you all 100%. I don't believe it was political with any of us. I believe that we're just on opposite sides of what we think is right for the kids. And it's, really, it's as simple as that. If I thought that anybody here didn't care about the kids at that school, I just, it's just that kind of simple. I, I would not do that because I won't work in a situation like that. So it's not about not trusting what you guys did. I walked away the other night. I wasn't upset with, with any of you guys. I was upset the way it went, but it wasn't being upset with any of you guys in particular because I think you honestly, you know, whoever's right, whoever's wrong, I don't know, but nobody is intentionally trying to do something that's going to hurt. No, it's not political at this level. It's, I believe it's. It's political at the level this is coming. It's a very political thing that's across, across this country. It's way past it. I want to say one more thing. You know, this pandemic's been going on for what, a year and eight months or whatever? Seven years, maybe. Seems like since I've never I was. Never had any leadership from higher up. It's always like every city, every county, everybody had to make their own decisions. We never had good leadership when it should have all been scientific driven. And we never, it was, and now it's coming down. Now it's, we got to make a decision now. And it's like crazy. It's, we could have Joseph give a dissertation on home rule. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I still feel that if the parents have the option to do it, I, we, we, we're doing, we're following the law. But if you guys find it in your heart to go that extra mile to have the kids, you know, you guys have the option now. Think about your fellow neighbors. This is not Orlando. This is not Tallahassee. This is the town of Oakland. Consider that. Second your motion. Motion's been seconded. Any further comment or questions at the table? I just want to comment. I'm, I'm, I'm following the law. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. I'm looking at the law. As a healthcare professional for over 28 years, I'm not going to fight people, but I'm following the law. And I would not visit a school because I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. When I go someplace, I'm wearing a mask. I got four masks in my car and I always keep one on me. But I'm not going to fight any parent, um, you know, to make a decision. But I, my decision, I'm a pharmacist. I look at pharmacy data every single day, every day. And I see COVID stuff that is affecting this entire country every single day. So my decision or how I feel is really about what I see every day. And what I've learned over the 20 plus years, but I am going to follow the law. So if you want to question how I feel, it's not about political, it's about what I've seen as a healthcare professional, what's in the hospital, what's out here in the, in, in the, um, in the community. And it's not just masks, it's masks, social distancing, and it's vaccination. And our kids can't get vaccinated. So it's the whole, it's, it's all three coming together. But at the end of the day, we got to follow the law. And so, you know, I came in there, I saw that when it came out, I said, hey, 
we got to follow the law. We're not going to fight this back and forth. We got to follow the law. So it's just it, it it's an it's a bad it's a hill we're we're not yeah. we're, we'll, we will die on it. So it's not by what the the the, the school is doing. Um, just like what no. somebody said, you know, when these kids leave, they out there in the football field, these different places. I would tell you, I, I've been three different places in the last month, and I've seen three different types of activity. I've seen masks everywhere. I've seen no masks, and I've seen a mix in between. When I go to the grocery store, I got a mask on. So the money you put down the speaker is the general college. Yeah, but, 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 but I'm here it's talking. talking. We're done with public I'm comment. Did you say your kids don't wear masks to school? No, I didn't say We're that. We're done okay. with public comment. I'm, I'm talking. Seconds, minutes, not hours. You said your kid didn't wear a mask. Hey. I, didn't know. I said I have an 18 year old daughter who's in college. Joseph. She's wearing a mask. That's what I said, sir. I mean, I'm just No, I said I have an 18 year old. What I'm saying is, but we're not fighting. What I'm saying, I'm trying to say is, we're not fighting it. But what I'm saying is, I'm using my clinical Correct. experience. No, and I'm not talking about, I'm talking about. I know, I know. I, I, we're done with public comment. Yeah, yeah. You may say whatever you would like. That's all, all I'm saying is we're going to follow the law, but at the same time, there's a lot. That's there's going. a lot of us who are going to follow the law, but that's not what we want to do. The numbers are getting better. Like, For whatever uh, reason. Whatever the reason is, the numbers are getting better, and that makes it a little bit easier. Oh, the point I was trying to say is these kids are leaving and going out. These teachers can't control when the kids are nope. And so whatever they're doing every night, every day, every week, they, they can't. So that that's not part of the conversation because these kids, gonna, these families, everybody's gonna do what they, want, what they want to do. But at the end of the day, you have to follow the law, that's it. Yeah. All right, I think we have beat this one to a pulp. So um, unless, unless anybody at the table has anything else to say, I'm calling for the vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody. All right. Town manager report. We'll stay and finish the meeting. Thanks. I think so. That'd be great. Can you take it over to the other table right over there? Thank you. Uh, I just have a couple of things uh, real quick to uh, follow up on. So we've got a cemetery consultant on on board now. We met with them out on the site for the historic cemetery right there by Longley. Uh, and we're getting that project moving forward with doing the, uh, the uh, management report for the cemetery. Um, Hispanic Heritage was uh, a, a great success on the 17th. Uh, we had over 100 guests. Um, it was a, it was a great. Uh, it was really uh, nice. So, um, and the empanadas were unbelievably good. Yeah, I, I had a Cuban that was really good. Uh, we got a lot of press coverage. Uh, I believe Alicia sent this mm -hmm. out to you today, um, but we got a lot of press coverage and a lot of hits on that, and it was a great event. A um, couple other smaller things. Lakeside Church. We'll be pouring concrete next Wednesday. They're going to do it very early at 4 a.m. Uh -huh. Very minimal impact to. I, I have let Jim Gordon with the Open Presbyterian Church know. Mike's going to talk to the one resident that's closest to. But for the most part, they're coming in off of 50. They won't be impacting school traffic or anything. That's great. They'll be doing their major pour for their slab on Wednesday of next week. Um, and they are following the process of, of getting permission for that. Um, we have our next complete street meeting on Thursday from 6 to 7.30. Uh, we had about 30 people at the first one. They've got some, some renderings and some modeling that they've done uh, for this one to, for discussion. Um, so anybody that can make that, uh, I hope to get another good turnout. And then we will take all this information, bringing it forward to the commission at a date to, to be determined uh, for a work session. Um, uh, the uh, other other big thing is the bridge closing. So they did close the bridge on Sunday night. Um, it's been very disruptive. We are being reactive to two things. We had a few things that we took care of today. 
Uh, we put a variable method sign over a whole island to get a lot of people thinking they could cut through. Uh, we, according um, to the contractor, there's been a couple people that have decided to use the pedestrian bridge as a road bridge. Um, oh, dang. So, and we do know that there are quite a few people going through Sansparilla, through Longleaf. Um, it is a public road. We will be out there making sure people are doing the speed limit. And um, we have added some rumble strips. We, uh, Mike was able to get those in. And a couple of, we'll have them in a couple of places as a reminder as you're getting to a pedestrian crossing or right near their mailboxes is I think where the other ones are gonna go. So that uh, we keep people doing the 20 miles an hour through there, so. Uh, and can we, um, can we put that up on what we've done? Um, yeah, we, I can I can talk with Alicia about, and, and the, the big thing is when people have questions, we've got a very responsive group now with the Turnpike Enterprise, and they do a very good job answering questions. They have made modifications to signs. Um, they will help us out. Yeah. So they're, they're, we put the number out there. It's on our Facebook, you know, with the, with the alert. So Stephanie Eisenberg is the, the lead on that. And mm -hmm. um, they are stepping up and, and doing a great job and with your questions. That's really, really good to hear. But anything that the town of Oakland does is yeah. what I'm talking about. Like if right. we put down the rumble strips, watch your speed, we'll be out there enforcing yeah. those things. I'll, I'll work with Alicia on some, some messaging over the next couple of weeks. I'm hoping it'll taper off as people it get will. used to it. it people, people will find their route. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing was uh, Jim Thomas passed away, and I don't know if the Commissioner Pollan was going to speak to it, but I would like to um, work with Mona Phipps and come back with a proclamation maybe in a month or so, just to that would be great. the influence that he had with the Nature Preserve and the town of Oakland. So I'll, I'll work on that if everybody's all right with that. Yeah, and j yeah. just bear in mind that um, the Nature Center was named after him. So I don't think this is one of those situations where we have to do something along those lines, but we, uh, a proclamation would be. Yeah, I, I just, yeah, we, I, I should have mentioned that. We did the education center at ONP is named after Jim Thomas. Um, uh, I just want to acknowledge, you know, what he did for the, for the, the nature preserve in the town. So that, that's what the proclamation would be about. Oh. Yeah, I think that would be good. I'd glad you brought that up. I did talk to Mona, Mona just thought she suggested we did a clock run. I think that's a great idea. That would be great. How's his wife doing? How's she, how's she doing? Uh, she, I heard she's not in good health, but not, I don't know any details. Well, she's around the same age as Jim, right? She's, I remember. Oh, she has COVID. Oh, geez. <laughs> actually, that's what he died from was COVID. That's a shame. All right. Anything else? That's all I've got. Thank you. Joseph, you can start. Okay. Um, just the, you, um, the, the next FLC is going to be 10 October 14th. It's always the third um, Thursday, but it's going to be October 14th. You'll probably get an email. It's going to be virtual again. And uh, we've got a good speaker that's going to come on board. Uh, so the email will come out real soon about that. It was moved to October 14th because we want to have a live meeting in the pop up, but because of the Delta surge and the COVID surge, right. we're, we're getting away from the live meetings, and so we're back to virtual again. Who's the president now? Mm -hmm. Who's the president? Uh, 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 what? You said who's the president? Pre uh, Florida Lee. Do you, do oh, you have a well, change in leadership? Well, the president is uh, Philip Walker out of Lakeland. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's the president, you know, yeah, that's the current president. He's a commissioner of Lakeland, Philip Walker. Yeah, 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 yeah I'm sorry. Yeah, it, doesn't that change? It just changed in August? Yes. Yeah, 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 okay. I'm, I, I apologize, yeah. But I'm talking about Tri-County, I'm talking about Tri-County. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, no I'm sorry. He's president of Tri-County. Uh, Joseph McMullen. <laughs> he still is. He still is. <laughs> okay. Like to meet the gentleman. Yeah, yeah really, never heard of him. Yeah. The Tri County is annual. It's the, it's the county here. I, know, I, I got it. This guy is a um, Sanford manager on, on Napoleon Bonaparte. Oh, okay. That's funny. Yeah. I mean, North Bonaparte. I'll call Napoleon. Please don't tell him I said that. North Bonaparte. <laughs> I was messing up. North Bonaparte, the Sanford San City manager. All right. All right. Coming, man, um, the president. So we're the calendar. Tri County is August, August. I, I'm, I, 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 yeah. I'm sorry, I'm we punchy. Still, we still got a couple more months of me.
some good stuff. <laughs> I apologize. But I'll tell Joseph McMahon that you was asking about the presidency. Like, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> I love you too. All right. You want Sal. me to move back? No, 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 no. Sal. <laughs> I, I just want to, for the record, thank the staff again for the, the event that we had for the, you know, that was wonderful. The Hispanic celebration a month, the whole, I mean, I'm super happy, ecstatic about the turnout wasn't there long, I think. that we had. Yeah. And yeah. like I was explaining to you earlier, um, I was explaining to your counterpart, Mr. Joseph McMullen <laughs> earlier, that um, this is just the tip of the iceberg of events to come. And thank you for the, the commissioners and vice mayor and mayor that allowed us to have that event and to kick off, you know, what's what's to come. I can only wait. And I, I don't mean just for the Hispanic hair celebration, but for everything. I had so many um, citizens reach out to me that they, that they did not know that, uh, you know, there was an Hispanic commissioner that don't speak too much, too well English and reaching out to me saying, I did not know I've been here for four years or six years or whatever. I was really happy that they were reaching out and um, and welcome them to all the future events, regardless if it's Hispanic or not. And just very thankful and thank you so much. Very happy about it, static about it. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'll tell you, you're right. Cause I, you know, it was hard for me. I couldn't make those Friday ones during the day. Cause yeah, me too, I've made it. <laughs> but that's, so that was the first one. And I was, after all the hard work we have all put into it and staff has put into it and the dreams we had for it, it was everything that I thought it would be. Mm, it, it really was, was, it was cool. Make sure you tell Alicia. Oh, you should do, yeah. Did you hear us, Alicia? I heard you. Thank you very much. Happy to. Yeah. It was great. Rick? Uh, nothing more than what we already talked about, but you should be calm. Hi. I'm good. I'm great. So um, I think uh, we have done some good work here tonight, some hard work. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, so, Joseph? All hearts and minds are satisfied. Let's adjourn. It is 9 p.m. Yeah. Still the public's